I'm with Mimi Rosmarin from Mayor Panim. Uh, now, Mimi, remind us again, what is Mayor Panim? So, Mayor Panim is a social service organization based here in Israel. And our primary mission is to alleviate the suffering of hunger and to help break the cycle of poverty here in Israel through our five branches. Now, on October 7th, there was a terror attack in Israel. How did you get to hear about it? So I, my family and I, we are um, observant. So we don't use phones or internet or anything on, it was Simchat Torah, it was a holiday. So, well, we were woken up by <laughs> quite loud booms. Um, thankfully, we didn't have sirens in our town, but we were woken up and we knew something was wrong and off. My husband actually thought, since we live in an area near a firing range, he thought it was like the army doing practice drills. And he actually woke up like infuriated that they would be doing it on a holiday and it's so early in the morning. <laughs> but then we kind of moved on with our day. My husband left to go to synagogue to services for the holiday. And he came home quite quickly. <laughs> to tell me what was going on, that at that point, it was about nine in the morning that terrorists had infiltrated some cities in the Gaza area and that those were not practice. <laughs> those were actually rockets being shot towards us from Hamas all over the Gaza Strip and that at synagogue, many of the men were leaving to go and fight. They were getting called up either both in their regular service, you know, like the 18 to 20 year olds. And then also people in reserves were told, go and check with your reserves unit. And also if you don't need to be called up and you do have a gun, please come back to synagogue with a gun because we don't know what's gonna happen even in our little town. So everyone needed to stay alert. Me and the children stayed home because we wanted to just keep everything safe and contained. So was that scary for you? Because you don't know what's happening. You don't know whether you are in a threat or in a danger. Yeah, it was the worst. <laughs> it was the worst day of my life. Mm -hmm. I think we feel really lucky that we didn't have any actual sirens. And on that first day, we didn't have to go into the bomb shelter. But there was certainly a feeling of having no idea what was in store, what the future held, if this was something that was going to spread from the Gaza area to we live um, in a town very close to Palestinian villages in the West Bank, so that if the villagers near our town would, you know, storm the wall or anything. So it was terrible. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when did you realize that Mayor Panim had to actually step into action? Yeah, so that evening, when the holiday ended, I checked in with our CEO and all of our staff, and as he was checking in with all of our staff, just to make sure everyone was safe and to check in on their families and their children and their husbands that are called up. And from that Saturday night of October 7th, we, our staff quickly jumped to action and realized this wasn't a normal time and that when there are times of crisis that's where mayor Panim can really utilize our connections and our network to take the extra effort to help people so even from that saturday night our staff who had sons and sons-in-law and family fighting in the war zones on the first day got to work opened up our kitchens opened up our restaurant style soup kitchens and started cooking meals for troops on the front lines that were called up truly without any plan by the israeli government and certainly no supply chain to feed them and care for them and for displaced families that were at the moment fleeing their homes saying that mayor penning branches throughout the country were places where you can drop off items for displaced families and that displaced families along the way could come and get what they need and food and, and starting to take meals right away, Saturday night, Sunday morning, to troops that were, were sent to the front lines. Mm. So have people been giving food to you so that you can help the people that are in need? A hundred percent. I think one, one part of our mission that expanded is that we, in a typical day at Mayor Panim in the before times, as we said last spring, we were cooking about 2,500 meals a day. And in those first few weeks of war, the first four weeks of war, until the Israeli idea really got the supply chain in order, we were cooking 10 to 20,000 
extra meals a day between our five branches. And that meant opening at four o'clock in the morning, you know, because the oven capacity is only what it is and serving as a drop-off point to get goods and housewares, warm clothing to all of the displaced families, all of the reserves troops, getting them fresh underwear and soap and shampoo and things that people that just left their homes on October 7th to fight, to, to join the effort to secure our country and our borders with nothing. So it has really become our mission to help and serve as a safety net for those hundreds of thousands of people in the last 118 days. How important is a cooked meal for the soldiers? I think for for now, well, we can go back to the before times because in the first few weeks before there was a supply chain, they really were not meals for these troops that ran to defend our, our country. And it was essential, life-saving. We had the network, we had the infrastructure, and we had troops calling us from the front line saying we haven't had a fresh meal, we haven't had food. And food for them was like a, a roll and you know a hummus spread. We're not talking beautiful, <laughs> we're not nothing beautiful, nothing extensive. I think more recently in the last two months of the war, since they've been eating you know rations, army rations for days and weeks on end, the mayor penny meals really give them a taste of home. And these are troops that go in to the battlefield for weeks at a time without a break. And you know the, the ones that are fighting in Gaza without running water, without heat, without anything. So our meals are now really serving as a way to give them morale, to give them strength, to give them a break from you know, ready to eat meals, which are apparently not the height of gourmet food, and just to show them that the country is behind them, that we care for them, and that we're there with them in any way we can be. I imagine they're very appreciative of getting these meals. They are amazing. These young men and these older men that are in reserves duties send us videos and we see their smiling faces and we see them thanking us. And the fact that they are even doing that is so incredibly humbling because it's all done with us, with love and appreciation. And of course you're helping the people who've actually had to flee their homes. Have people just fled with nothing? Yes. This country has 200,000 people that are displaced from their homes in the Gaza area and on the, on the northern border. Many who are staying in hotels all over the country and we are providing them meals, we are providing them blankets. Just last week we provided all the children at one of the hotels with these um, warm pajamas and slippers and new board games and they were so happy and so excited that they made a little impromptu like pajama party in the hotel, in the lobby. These are families that left October 7th, their homes having no idea how long, and they still don't know how long they're gonna be gone for, that are sharing you know, a two hotel room connecting rooms with their family of three, four children. Their lives are on pause. So anything we can do for these, these people to help make this time easier is something we're really committed to doing. Is this one of the biggest things that you've ever had to respond to? Oh my God, 100% yes. Before this, I would have said COVID was our biggest challenge because we had to upend all our operations and move everything from eating in our dining centers to only take out. And the needs skyrocketed because so many people were out of work and couldn't make ends meet. And now COVID looks like a vacation. <laughs> Truly, we are still living in fear. Just this week, there were 11 rockets which created sirens in most of the country, most of the center of the country. We, I had a siren this week on Monday afternoon for 26. And we were living in fear. We wake up every morning worried about our children and our husbands and our fighters and our hostages. And the more we learn about what our troops are experiencing and what the, the the victims and the horrific acts that continue to happen and the more we think about our hostages the harder it is to really feel hopeful for the future but the work we're doing allows us to feel like we're a part of a solution and we're helping someone and we're not just going to sit in despair and fear we're going to be proactive and do what we can what we do which is provide support meals and hope and that we're gonna do that during this time. Are the people fleeing actually telling you their stories? Yes, they are. We obviously, you know, we treat everyone, and, and part of what we talked about last spring was the mayor penny mythos of treating everyone with dignity and respect, and no questions asked, and everyone that walks in our door is just a part of our family and welcome, but 
when people want to share and then people need to share we're, we're a, a warm listening ear and a shoulder and the stories are horrendous and the fear that they experienced and the continuing chaos in their lives especially when you think of most of the people that fleed their homes left places that were in danger and most people that are are displaced know someone that was lost know someone that's fighting know someone that's a hostage or was a hostage so these are people that are experiencing the worst horrors for the jewish people since the holocaust and continuing to live in this perpetual nightmare of not being able to go home or know when they can even go home. I imagine because they can't go home, they're not working as well. So if you're not working, you've got no money. So you really are relying on other people to help feed you. Absolutely. And, you know, for some of them, you know, they might be business owners in their town, which is evacuated. So they don't even, it's not, you know, some people work remotely or have have offices elsewhere. But I think the Israeli government has done an extraordinary job telling them, you take care of yourselves, you take care of your families, you know, we're going to manage the, we're going to manage everything you need in this difficult time. But there is an uncertainty and they are in a budget. So, you know, we are trying to provide them with meals and with goods to help them really focus on taking care of their emotional needs and their families during this time. Uh, now people come here to the center to get a meal. So are you having to cook all your meals from different centers and then take it out to them, to their location? So that's a wonderful question. I would say that we have five centers throughout Israel and each of our locations is responding to the crisis in a little bit of a different way. Our Ora Kiva location, which is adjacent to the town of Kesaria, really is serving as our hub for meals for troops because they have the largest capacity and the largest volunteer base. And they are continuing to cook thousands of additional meals and they have the volunteer infrastructure to get it to many people all over the area. Our Demona branch is in the south and they've been able to take care of tremendous amounts of displaced people in the south and get meals and goods to troops that are closer to that, that southern region. Here in Jerusalem, actually, it's incredible because there are There's a pause in so many airlines flying right now in and out of Israel, especially the American-based airlines. Some of the European airlines have restarted, but not the American airlines. And we have a relationship with the caterer at Ben Gurion Airport, who have been providing us thousands and thousands of meals that we can give to displaced families that are here in the Jerusalem area and are needy here in the Jerusalem location. And that is enabling us to spend our budget helping other branches and helping people in other places. So most of the time for our displaced families, we're trying to get the meals to them in their hotels. But people are coming in. Definitely people are affected by this in an economic way. People in the hospitality industry, people in the tourism industry. And we're really grateful to be part of the solution to help the the catering crew at Ben Gurion Airport keep their jobs. So the soldiers are in Gaza fighting the war. So do you feel that you are fighting the war as well by helping providing for all these people? I would love to say that. (laughs) Personally, I have uh, my sister's husband, my brother-in-law, has been fighting in Gaza. And he's been home a few times on short leaves and doesn't want to talk about what he sees. He just wants to talk about family and pure enjoyment while he's home. But given my personal connection to what they're experiencing, I feel like I'm doing the bare minimum by doing the work we do here. But I do feel like the work we're doing is for good. And I know, especially because it affects my family so personally, he is who we have in mind when I'm doing my work and and even though I'm not doing not close to the heroic and brave and courageous work that they are doing defending all of Israel um, and I would say even all of the Jewish people worldwide um, it feels good to be a part of of the solution. Mm. What is your prayer and your hope for the future at the moment? Oh gosh, Paul. Um, you know, I, I I'm in a hopeless moment. It it's been a rough, and it doesn't help that the weather's been rainy and gloomy over the past week. Every day I wake up hoping that our hostages will be released, that our troops can return home, that the terrorists in Hamas will be eliminated, so that the Palestinian people can live free in their homes, and that the Jewish people can live in peace next to them and that this entire period was a nightmare that my children won't inherit, but it's increasingly difficult and feeling like it's, it's just going to go on. If people around the world want to help in the war effort, what is your website and can people actually give to help you to help the people that are desperately in need? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think these types of conversations and, and sharing our stories with the world and sharing what we're doing is incredibly healing. Our website is www.mayorpanim.org, M-E-I-R. P-A-N-I-M dot org. And I know that's a, it's a mouthful. As we talked about last spring, our name actually means to brighten the face. Mayor is to brighten and Panim is the face. And that is our goal, I think, to help people that are suffering during their time of need, serving as a safety net, and to truly brighten people's faces in their most difficult time in their lives. We never thought we would be cooking meals to support troops in the IDF that have been in service for three months. And we never thought we would need to have this network to help 200,000 people that are displaced from their homes, but we're privileged to be able to do so. Okay, Mimi, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. Thank you for coming in. And I just hope that the next time we speak, you know, this will all be in the past.